panel is the power of storytelling, sharing experiences to foster belonging. How many of you have ever had a conversation with somebody that you did not know, and as you were talking, or maybe you even had a, a preconceived notion about that person, and as you begin speaking to them, all of a sudden, something clicked. You had a similarity. You ever been there? You heard their story, they heard yours, and all of a sudden, it's like, wow. Now you're probably best friends with somebody you might not ever be best friends with, all because you told a story. So storytelling is very powerful. So at this moment, I will go ahead and ask our guest, for our panelists, to come on and, and have a seat. So I just want to highlight what this is going to be about today. This is a discussion to highlight the fact that sharing experiences and storytelling play vital roles in actually creating a sense of belonging in the workplace. Today's topic is belonging. So everything will deal with us belonging. And it's, it's vital that we all understand that we belong to the Chapel Corps, to the Air Force, but also to one another. And we're accountable to one another in that belonging and in that creating of a, belong, a belonging space, excuse me. So when we storytell, Believe it or not, it creates empathy, it builds understanding, it forges bonds among colleagues, all of which are essential for cultivating a positive and inclusive work environment. And so today, I'm asking all of our panelists to be yourselves. <laughs> I don't expect anything else. <laughs> uh, but we want to promote understanding and empathy. We want to build trustful relationships with your responses, create shared experiences, facilitate learning and growth, and then foster inclusivity and respect. So as you answer these questions, ask that you're thinking through those topics as you uh, give a response this morning. So this morning, we have on our panel today, we have Chaplain Colonel James Danford. We have Chaplain Miosha Wilson, Lieutenant Colonel. We have Senior Anthony Devole. And Senior Arania Adams. Did I get that right? Close. A2. I was told to call you A2. Does that work? OK. We have A2. It's like, if you get that wrong, your mentor, your mentee told me if I got that wrong, she was going to get me, so A2. Um, so we will start, if you can, by just introducing yourself, a little bit about yourself, where you are located, what you do, and anything else you want to uh, let the audience know. Sir, we'll start with you. So my goal today is to work in Senior Master Sergeant Sweet Face and Negative Hot Dog. That's... <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, so I... I'm Chaplain Jamie Dantford, uh, career reservist, uh, came in, uh, always been a reservist, was a TR until I became an AGR at Reserve Command, uh, and I'm currently the command chaplain. Uh, probably the most important thing is yesterday I celebrated 30 years with uh, my wife, and uh, she has... Yeah. One more day that she did not kill me in my sleep. <laughs> Ma'am? Good morning, everybody. I am Miosha Wilson. I am the senior chaplain at Joint Base Anacostia Bowling, which is right here in Washington, D.C. And I am just grateful to be in this uniform with this cross on, having the privilege of leading and serving the people that I get to lead and serve, two of which were MCs yesterday, Chaplain O'Connell is on our way to Maxwell, but she just left our team, and Sergeant Fuavai is certainly still part of our team. So I'm grateful to be here and looking forward to sharing and learning. Senior. Good morning. I'm Tony DeVoyle, and I've um, had the privilege to serve with you all in all kinds of capacities for about 20 or three years or so. Uh, was Reg Af for 14 years, IMA two and a half and some change, 
and been AGR for um, six years. So um, I'm a Chaplain Corps kid, grew up in the Chaplain Corps. And um, what a pleasure to be on the stage with these folks because I have stories with all three of them. So uh, <laughs> kind of full circle for me. And um, been married 17 years to my best friend Robin. Uh, three kiddos, 14, my daughter's 14. So some of y'all know how hard that can be. Uh, an 11 year old son and a 10 year old son. So looking forward to sharing, thank you. Good morning, good morning. I am Senior Master Sergeant Arionea Adams. Mouthful first name, right? Um, hence why they say A2, or in English, Ariana. Um, I know a lot of people have been looking at me very weird, like who's the Canadian girl? Um, the reality is I literally rejoined my family, the Chapel Corps family, yesterday morning. I have been out of the career field for about three years as a professional military education instructor and in an exchange program. So I've been teaching in French, Canada, Quebec, and now I am back and I'll be joining the A1Z, Air Force Resiliency Division. Very excited about that. Um, very excited to be back. This should be my last day wearing this. It's kind of a reminder to go finish my out processing since it's here at AFDW. Um, and, and process into the right location. I have been, or I'm a pipeline religious affairs airman, so I'm at 20, and I'm still involved, still doing the ride, so yeah, I look forward to your questions and answering them. Thank you for those wonderful introductions. And so we will start this off with our first question. Uh, we'll start with you, Chaplain Danford and it'll work our way uh, around. First question is, can you share a personal experience where storytelling significantly impacted your sense of belonging in a professional setting? So, um, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was trying to, I was trying to think through these uh, questions as, as, as we got them. As far as a, a specific story, it's just hard to, to narrow down. So I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit at, a, at an upper level. And I stole this idea from a guy by the name of, of Theon Hill, who is an associate in communications at Wheaton College. And he said the, the best way to start a conversation is, I don't understand, help me understand what I don't understand. Um, and so I've tried to, any staff I've been on, any team I've been on, I understand my experience makes me an expert in my experience. And that's all. Um, and oftentimes when I, when I open with that, what I like is it gets the other person talking and me to try to find those points of contact of, of where we're at. I, I know that did not answer your question uh, of a specific story because honestly I was racking my brain of a specific story to where I felt part of a team and couldn't come up with one but there's little snippets of those of just of just try and that was the best way I've had to try to immediately get to the point of, let me know who you are, let me know where you come from, and try to find a deeper level. I, I don't like, I'm not comfortable with upper level conversation, the weather, football, stuff like that. I, I wanna go deeper, and I wanna go deeper a lot of times quicker than people want to. <laughs> um, and, and so that, that's one of the things that I've used to get to the heart of the matter who you are, where you're from, what makes you tick, stuff like that. Sir, can I, can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Sure. How, how did that help you as a leader? Well, it immediately, <clears throat> I would say it helps me as a leader. Um, and you'd probably have to ask people that follow <laughs> if it did. Uh, it lets me know where they're coming from and what similarities that we ha do we have that we can uh, that we can point to, hey, this is where we are similar. And then what differences do we have that are completely okay? 
what different experiences do we have that we can look at from, from a different lens and things like that. I, I think it builds that whoever I'm talking to, their opinion and everything they are matters to me. Thank you, sir. Chaplain Wilson. So I'm going to share a story, and I, I'm going to share it. I'm giving a caveat and disclaimer because I don't want it to come across as, oh, woe is her. Um, I want you to hear it and hear all of what I will say. So Senior Master Sergeant DeVoyle and I were stationed together at my first chaplain assignment. I commissioned initially as a personnel officer and ended up in the chaplain corps, which is exactly where I needed to be. But I had an experience where I wasn't sure if it's where I belonged. And that experience was at the basic chaplain course. And I did exceptionally well by the grace of God during that course, but some of my classmates, my cohort, didn't appreciate my success. So there was a specific break one day in class. I go to the restroom, I come back to where I was sitting and there's a pile of pennies at my desk. And maybe a nickel, maybe a dime, but a pile of pennies. And so I look at the guy next to me, I was like, what is this? And he's like, I, I don't know, I have no idea. And a classmate, a cohort, a fellow chaplain, across the room said, Sanders is my maiden name. He said, hey Sanders, we took up a collection for you because that's what we think you're worth. And so I, I wasn't sure that this is where I belonged based on that exchange, that experience. And I remember I could not wait to graduate and get out of there. I just remember feeling that way. And I'm so grateful that the team I went to, which was, my, again, my first chaplain assignment, McDill Air Force Base, Chaplain Spencer was my first chaplain supervisor. David Butcherick was my first wing chaplain. They loved me, they welcomed me, they gave me freedom to be who I was and as unique as I wanted to be in executing ministry. And so it was redemptive to me to have a team that embraced all of who I believe I was at that time. So it reminded me how much more intentional I need to be as a leader in embracing all of who any given teammate walks in and presents themselves as and to invite them to be as authentic as they want to be and to do my best to try to exploit in a good way all of the gifts, talent, skills, and abilities that they possess. Uh, and a reminder that everybody's not for me. And that's okay, because there's a temptation to diminish my shine, or the Lord's light shining through me, if you will, because of those who aren't for me. But I'm, I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to lead, I'm here to serve, I'm here to make a difference to the glory of God. And so I think it's important for us to not be distracted by the people who refuse to receive the God in us, period but to stay focused on what your divine assignment is in any given assignment. Same question for you. Same question for you, Senior. Okay. Um, you know, I have a way of running across people that have been through similar things, and um, I know that's many of your stories as well, right? Uh, it just sort of happens that way, that a lot of times people will cross your paths that you can relate to that have been through um, some of the same challenges, and um, as I'm listening to, to Chaplain Wilson, um, we lost our second daughter, was a full-term stillborn, and, um, you know, we had a funeral there, at McDill Chapel, and um, shortly after Chaplain Wiggins left, um, Chaplain Wilson came, and um, we had our third child, a healthy, 
uh, baby boy and she um, dedicated him. So just stories of redemption like that, I think that oftentimes um, moms that go through things like that often fear that, was there something wrong with me, um, my body, is it safe for me to have another child, um, why did this happen to me, those kinds of questions. Like, um, and I, you know, it hits different for moms than dads. Um, I was able to, to, to move through things better and had an understanding with God, but you know, moms hurt a little different. So just seeing my, my wife kind of go through that, but also um, the story of redemption through that and that some of those fears were overcome. Um, I, I find that you know, I, meet, I meet people like that, that, that have been through that. So the, the power of connection there and understanding of the power of connection when we share. I was listening to Sergeant Webb talk about her time at Craig Joint Theater Hospital a little bit last night and just automatically felt bonded to her and I'm just meeting her. So even the stories that we have among one another that, that unite us in ways that are sort of beyond, beyond comprehension. <laughs> Um, I could go on and on, really, um, in, in, in stories like that, that, that um, for whatever reason, that member ended up in my office. And, and, and um, within a few moments, I understood why. Thank you. Senior, do you need me to repeat it, or are you? Um, I think I'm good. Okay, yes, I've been holding on to it. Okay. Um, usually when your last name's A, you're used to going first, right? So I was like, wow, I'm going last. Accept this and pay attention. <laughs> so um, when it comes to storytelling, I'm really big on, a lot of people talk about the art of it, but I think the power of it is amazing. It really creates connection from one person to another. For myself, uh, I'm very much an island kid my family's super diverse, um, Puerto Rican and Jamaican. And so I have family who has strong melanin and some have none whatsoever. So for me, diversity and inclusion was always prevalent in my life. Both happened simultaneously. And then I joined the military and it was a little bit different. I saw the diversity, I didn't always see the inclusion piece. And it was the storytelling that allowed me to connect because of what I knew growing up. You might look different than me, however, there's some things that I can connect with. And having the ability to have the career that I've had, just recently using it in Canada, totally different uh, experience. I was the sole American, French is language five, not one. And a lot of times I thought I had it right and I didn't. So starting from ground zero with people at this very big age of mine was weird. So I asked myself, what can I connect with on this person, or about this person, excuse me? And so how do I belong in their story? How do they belong in mine? And what's our journey together has really helped. And I got that from a former chief of staff, General Golfing. He used to be my favorite airman. Um, I still scream air power. Sorry to Sergeant McKenzie. Um, and my reason for bringing that up is he always would talk about every airman has a story. So teaching at NCOA and Kisling Academy down in Germany as a tech sergeant, I had an opportunity to deal with a myriad of airmen. And for me, it was overwhelming. Those who know me, I'm an introvert. And so stepping out into that was challenging. You have to grow through it, to stretch through it. And he happened to come to our schoolhouse. And I, as he's doing that, it was my second class, first one solo. And I was trying to figure out how do I connect with these individuals for the next six weeks, being that I'm the youngest person in this room and I'm their instructor. A lot of times they did not want to deal with me. What could you teach me? And so his arrival to the academy was on time because he told a story about an airman who got caught in a fire 
very, are severely burned and had to learn all the basics again, eating, walking, talking, you name it. And how even though he was a USAFI of Africa commander at the time, he would go to that hospital every day unless he had to fly out. Then he would call the airmen. Crazy enough, as he's telling that story, the airman is in my class. And so the airman is crying. He said, I didn't know he would remember me. And so I'm being a, a goober, and I'm like, oh, General Goldfein, so happy to see you. He's like, are you Sergeant M's uh, instructor? I said, yes, sir. He was like, bring him up here. And he didn't want to go up there. But him telling his story allowed us to look past, just being honest, some of the exterior, some of what the burn had done to him. It helped us open up to see the human element of him. And he really came out of his shell and made the best. It was probably the best class I had, and we still stay connected. And so knowing that there's always more to a person really helps me when it comes to leadership because this covers so much, right? So, yeah. Thank you, Senior. So our next question. Uh, it can be very difficult in a work environment as a leader trying to create an inclusive and safe space uh, for those that work for you. Uh, just because of differences, maybe theologically, religiously, whatever it may be, there, there may be some differences there, and that can be scary in stepping outside of your own comfort zone. So in that, uh, how can leaders leverage the power of storytelling to foster an inclusive and welcoming work environment? We'll start with you, sir. I think it starts as a leader with giving people permission uh, to talk and to share. And by permission, I mean not just saying, hey, you can share, but specifically asking and the freedom to share from their tradition. Uh, Chum Spencer talked about it yesterday when he was the wing chaplain. You know, do a devotion from your tradition and be true to your tradition. Uh, at, at our staff uh, meeting, we have a prayer time and a devotion time, and that is the rule. If, if you're leading prayer time, you lead prayer time based on your tradition. You know, it's a, it's a volunteer time to come. Um, when we have staff meeting, I, I try my best to go around the room and ask each person, what's your thoughts? Do you have, you know, what, what's your thoughts on this? Because we do have some people who will sit back, you know, and, and not engage in everything. So I think that's part of it, is not just to give people permission, but also to do everything you can to draw out as best you can uh, their thoughts and ideas. Thank you, sir. Chaplain Wilson? I would add to that, be curious and be genuinely curious about the people that you spend more time with than likely your significant other or children. One of the things, I'm not a fan of meetings, so we only do a staff meeting once a month. But in that meeting, one of the first things I do is I start with a question and we go around and it might be something like, what has the last month or week or two weeks been like for you? Because I wanna know where they are mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. I'm not asking about the mission. I wanna know about you. And they all know that I'm not moving on until I hear from everybody. Even if there are times when I specifically say that out my mouth, I'm not moving on until I hear from everybody. And we just go around. And it's amazing to me that when I first started that two years ago upon my arrival, some didn't know how to take it because they weren't used to somebody being interested in knowing how they are, which I think is a problem. Nevertheless, I'm so grateful that today, it's been crazy. And they just say all of what life has been like for them. And so to me, it, it communicates some level of trust that has been established, some level of psychological safety, if you will, uh, that has been established to the glory of God. I'm, I'm not talking about me. 
I think I'm simply a vessel who has tried to do something that ain't nobody else done for them. And so it is proving to be fruitful and helping them be comfortable, be themselves. Thank you. Senior, I'm gonna ask you a different question. <laughs> How do you navigate the fear of telling your story, of when you tell your story, being used against you, rather uh, personally or professionally? How do you tell that without it? Yeah, I mean, there, there's some element of risk involved, right? And um, I think in with, with, with working with leaders, we see that that's the fear, that, well, if I make myself vulnerable, if I go into a room where people that I lead are hurting and I don't know the answer, then that looks bad on me. So <laughs> I think the answer is do it afraid. Um, in that leaders set the tone for vulnerability in an organization. Quick story, um, we've done open forums at Dobbins after a couple of really tough events in our nation. The last one, uh, after Tyree Nichols was killed, we went to the NAF by request. 40-something people came in the room and just like Chaplin was, was sharing, we created a space there for them to share. 50-something-year-old men wailing, women, young, old, some from Memphis who were directly impacted. And I'll tell you the difference between that meeting and ones that we've done in the past was an 06 requested it, and she sat in the middle and watched everything. She really didn't say much, but just being present in the room with her people and taking everything in to gain an understanding of the pain, right? We used to call it, what well, we still do, ministry of presence, right? Not always having to fill those empty spaces with an answer, but just being alongside people in their pain. And then I've seen events that we've tried to host where there was no leader. It's just me and the chaplain with a great idea. And two or three people come together and it's like, mm, sort of effective, but nothing like what took place in the room that, that day when people were there with their commander, there with their chief, their shirt, and everyone took this journey together. So I'd say the answer, I hope that answers the question, do it afraid, take the risk. You know, I'm reminded that, you know, the Latin for the word sergeant is servant. So, so, so the, the higher up we go, we're just entrusted to different levels of service and setting the tone, especially in those areas of, of, of vulnerability, so. Senior Adams, what happens when that vulnerability is being used in a negative way against you? How should one handle that? Wow, okay, so. I believe that there's a lesson in everything. And the ones that you can learn from are the ones that you choose to pay attention to. Um, it's so easy to sit in the phase of why. Why me, why is this happening, so on and so forth. Um, however, my perspective is look at the what now. Like how am I to respond versus react to this situation and what am I to do with it? Um, I'm a person of faith, so I ask those questions via prayer, and then I adjust accordingly, because if I sit in that, it takes on a life of its own that it may not have been intended to do. Um, when I'm working with others and they're going through something where they feel like their psychological safety was violated or where they had a moral injury, understanding them enough to provide them with coping skills that will help them get to the other side of the situation. Because it, it is gonna happen, it's not unique, but what do you do now? Thank you. Chaplain Danford. What role do you see storytelling in conflict resolution at work 
to help overcome resistance to change? I think storytelling gets to the heart of the matter, uh, where a lot of times with just conflict resolution, we can, we can keep in theory or we can keep in defining terms or everything like that, but storytelling, it, it, it's my experience. It, it, it's where I'm at. It's where the other person is at. And I mean, I, I was moved when Chaplain Wilson told the story of BCC. Uh, I was moved to anger. <laughs> uh, that, that story puts flesh on an issue and it's more difficult to say, oh, well, this is just a term or this is something uh, because you're dealing with, with a human uh, and you're dealing with their experience. So I think it's essential. Thank you, sir. Chaplain Wilson, can you answer that same question, please, ma'am? What, what comes to mind to me is co-creation. I think having a situation with a person invites us to be able to co-create a new story. So we get an opportunity to share whatever our baggage may be that we brought to this current conflict and, and talk through unresolved things and talk about how we're going to move forward and, and that's the co-creation of changing the narrative just a bit so that ultimately we're moving forward together with greater understanding of one another, with get greater respect for one another, and perhaps a lesson that can be shared. I think it's important that, that we not just talk about the times when we shine, but we also talk about the times when we miss the mark and we needed to go back and apologize and, and how this worked out. So sharing that type of information and experience, I think, is also part of storytelling. Thank you, ma'am. Senior? Yes, sir. Uh, for me, storytelling, especially in the context of conflict resolution, helps to sort of soften the heart toward empathy. Hmm. When we, when we understand um, what makes the person hurt and why, most normal people, once they're aware of that, will not continue to want to offend in that same spot. <laughs> so to me, it's, it's taking it deeper um, and doing the deeper work versus just um, um, moving beyond just surface interactions and pleasantries, but, but to really understand um, the why behind a person. Um, and I don't know that there's really another way to do that, but to tell your story. Thank you. Senior Adams. I think it fosters understanding, awareness, and then change. Um, a lot of times conflict is coming from a place of experience and trauma and sometimes it's just misunderstanding. And so being able to see if I'm in conflict with someone, what part of them am I speaking to? And what is it, what is my role as I offend this person or if I am doing something to actually elevate them, am I offended and if so, why? So there's a reflection point to it as well. Thank you. Chaplain Denford. How do you successfully respond when another's core beliefs either excludes you or attempts to bring you into their faith? Read that last part, please. How do you successfully respond when another's core values either excludes you or attempts to bring you into their faith? I'm probably not the best person to answer that question <laughs> because I tend to be secure in, in who I am, and the negative part of that is I can quickly put you in an I'm done with you file in my mind if, if we're not going to, you know, if, if you're not going to respect me or you try to make me what you want me to be. Now, the negative of that is I can keep people at an arm's length. Um, sometimes to a detriment to where I actually have to take it to prayer because I've really just, 
you know, again, I don't stay here. I go, I go deep. Um, so I have to work through to try to get to some level of a working relationship and back to where we can at least deal. But I confront the issue. Uh, I mean, the Voiles work for me. He, he knows I'm not passive aggressive. Sometimes I'm just aggressive, you know. So I, <laughs> here's, here's the issue. Let's talk it out. Let's work it out and, and go from there. Thank you, sir. Chaplain Wilson, can you answer that same? Sure. From an exclusion standpoint, I, I'm a straight shooter. And so I am most likely going to say something along the lines of, are you aware that your commentary, your behavior treats me as if I don't belong, as if I'm not welcome here? Are you aware of that? And let's just see where that conversation goes. If it is someone trying to pull me in or proselytize, um, then I probably would kind of take the therapeutic approach. It sounds important to you, you know? Um, can you say more? Uh, and just see where it goes um, and, and ultimately weave in. You know, I, I, I appreciate that you value where you are and are you open to hearing me share my value for where I am? Thank you, ma'am. Seeing the phone? Can you repeat it one more time? I'm sorry. I can. I can. How do you successfully respond when another's core values, excuse me, core beliefs either excludes you or attempts to bring you into their faith? So they either exclude you or want to convert you. So I think that the 20-something-year-old the DeVoyle would have gotten his feelings hurt and tucked and run. And in the same way, well, similar way that Chaplain Danford mentioned, arm's length. But as I'm getting a little more gray hair, um, I'm kind of more of the approach that Chaplain Wilson mentioned, that I think if someone tried to proselytize me, I would listen. Because, um, I mean, we, we've practiced this for years in our core, the diversity of faith, and I don't feel threatened by other people that believe differently than me. In fact, I embrace them. So I would take that opportunity probably to get to know more about that particular faith. Because um, when I look back at the times where I did learn, it was because someone, for whatever reason, was willing to share. So I'd, pr I'd probably try to take that as a, as a learning opportunity. I think as far as the exclusion piece, if it were a one-time deal, I don't really feel entitled to be included in everything, in every conversation. But if, or if it were just like repeated or really chronic, um, I would try to do, like, like uh, Chaplain mentioned, and just um, go to them privately, not in a staff meeting, <laughs> but privately, and just try to make them aware. Um, and in most cases, I'd say every case where I've had that in the Chaplain Corps, that meeting ended well, and there was understanding. Thank you. Senior Adams. Thank you for asking them to repeat the question. Right. I sometimes have a five-year-old attention span. It was just so when it comes to feeling excluded or feeling like someone is proselytizing, that's a unique spot. I would say that for me, I sit in between the panel responses that were already provided okay. um, just very briefly. As I mentioned, where I'm just coming from, the majority of the region that I resided in for the last three years uh, self-proclaimed to be atheist. And that is fine. However, that was not my experience personally. Um, additionally, there was a lot of thoughts on our politics down south. And so them really trying to get me invested in seeing their point of view but also commenting and me reminding them that I'm not playing dress up, it's not Halloween or whatever, like this is a real thing and this is what I represent. So 
I can't be as invested in the conversation that you might be in. Um, but I understand that it's important to you. Um, so finding that balance so that I don't repeat or perpetuate the narrative of someone feeling excluded or trying to apostolize to them, so. Thank you. Uh, Chaplain Wilson, this question is for you. Have you at any point in your career experienced uh, some situation where your ethnicity uh, affected, had a negative or positive effect uh, on the team or on your ministry? Uh, could you give a, maybe a story or something and then how you overcame that? So that's, that's a challenging question for me because in instances where maybe I haven't been treated the best, my own internal dialogue is it, is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I am black? Is it because I'm a black woman? Is it because I'm a woman in ministry and not everybody is okay with that? Is it a combination of all of that? Or is it, a, or is it that I'm generally an assertive person and I'll say what I think needs to be said, any combination of that. So, mm, I, okay, Lord. Um, I'm reminded of a story. Let me share it briefly. I was deployed uh, to an undisclosed location and I was the only chaplain on this compound. And the first thing that kind of happened was people stopped coming to worship. Some people stopped coming to worship because the chaplain's a woman now. That's one thing. But th I think the most painful thing for me that happened during that deployment was there was one particular squadron who I sensed that there was some oppressive stuff going on for those airmen and I don't appreciate oppression. And so I raised this issue to the commander the commander heard me the first couple of times and got tired of hearing me. So he called me to his office. This is a squadron commander. This compound was led by a group commander. So one of the squadron commanders, he calls me to his office and he says to me, you are a disruption to my unit and you are no longer welcome in any of my facilities. So if my people have an issue and need to talk to a chaplain, they can come to you and they're off duty time. And I just remember running to my RLB in tears. I held it together in the moment, but I could not believe that here I was, an advocate for his personnel, trying to help him understand his role in that oppression, but he didn't appreciate that. And so, all that to say, what did I do? Um, I had a, a, a very teary conversation with my husband on the phone in my RLB. Uh, but beyond that, I called my command chaplain, who was Chaplain Harvell at the time, and he planned a visit. He was always planning a visit, but during that visit, he came. He had a meeting with this squadron commander, and it seemed to be helpful to some extent. He still didn't invite me back to his unit. Um, but I had a conversation as well with the group commander on the ground. And he wanted it to just play out. And eventually, right before the squadron commander departed, the group commander called us together and said, y'all need to get this together because she needs access to your unit. And and so that went the way it went. Uh, but what did I take from that? Uh, I took that as a black woman, I don't have the, the privilege or the pass to approach what I believe is a white man in authority. I can't just approach him and think that he naturally wants to hear what I have to say. There are instances where I say to the white man in authority, sir, ma'am, or sir, in this instance, if ever there is an issue in your unit 
and you might be part of that issue, is that something you want me to share with you? Or how would you like me to respond, if at all? Because I think that particular commander represented a type of person who has to be in control and authority at all times. And so, okay, I can adjust how I lead and care uh, to accommodate you. Because ultimately, I, I need access wherever I am assigned. So I think it's important that we figure out what any given commander might need from us, what they're open to, what they're not open to, and work within that as best you can. And use your command chaplain to help you in instances where you need advocacy and you need help. Thank you, ma'am. Chaplain Danford, quick, quick question on that, uh, kind of a follow-up. Have you had an airman or a uh, chaplain come and have an issue with those particular problems? How were you able to help respond, maybe even have the team help and respond uh, around that? that issue? Yeah. Um, luckily, I have been in situations, of course, I wouldn't know if, you know, if they didn't feel comfortable coming to me because they wouldn't. Uh, but people have come and have shared, I feel that I'm being mistreated because either of my race or my gender. Uh, and so I have asked them how they wanted me to advocate for them. Um, you know, is this, and I learned this in counseling, um, to do everything I can to give power to the person who power has been taken away from. And to be very, I don't want to be seen as one more white guy making a decision for them. And so, because I'm a fixer, <laughs> and if you bring me a problem, I'm going to fix it. Uh, you know, my saint of a wife often says, husband, not counselor. I just need you to listen. And, and so I've, I've had to learn that and to ask them, how, you want, how do you want me to advocate for you? Um, and oftentimes it can be in conversations to, to help deal with this. And then oftentimes they can say, you know, would you, would you go with me or would you go on my behalf? Uh, that, that's how I do it. Thank you, sir. Senior, could you respond to that same uh, question from uh, the enlisted perspective? How I would advocate for someone that feels right. that way? Um, well, so I'm at a base that's 56% African American. And just to give you some demographics, our DTNF is 90% African American. Our senior leadership is 9% African American. So, um, yes. My office has been filled with people who um, feel uh, that they're not cared for and not empowered at various levels. Some levels, very high level, all the way down to um, airmen. And it's a challenge because we're advisors, right? Nobody here has command authority and makes final decisions. We're advisors and, and, and there can be a lot of stress in being an, an advisor and advising, but not getting to a proper outcome. Um, and I hate to say it, but um, in many of, when I look at the, at the advising, um, I've probably had more losses than wins as far as um, getting to the outcome that was probably more appropriate. So how do we deal with that? How, how, how do we as a, as a core <laughs> deal with that where, you, where you're the one doing the work? And the RARs even, right? I mean, everybody had a piece of that pie where we're, where we're advising and we're... we're coming alongside folks in this journey that's not the outcome that they wanted. Um, I think, um, you know, that it, it speaks to the need for one another 
to, to, to share the, the, the pain of that. But also things like this, where we're, we're getting after it at a strategic level and having these conversations. Um, so it's an endurance game, right? It's not something that's fixed overnight, but um, you know, having the hope um, to just endure through some of these things that, that our airmen are, are facing. Uh, those questions that in many instances are remaining unanswered. Um, I'm pleased to see many changes at our wing and our NAF. We're finally at a point where we don't have more people leaving out the back door than coming in the front. So there is a lot of positive change, but it's slow. Thank you. Senior Adams, can you respond to that question, please? The advocacy yes. portion? Yes, ma'am. Um, similar to Chaplain Danford, trying to understand how can I assist the person who has been offended? Um, because other than putting myself in their shoes, I still wouldn't fill them because there's a reason why in that situation, they may have taken it personal, even if it is in a professional environment. So what is it I can do to advocate for you? And then I will use my voice accordingly. Thank you. Chaplain Danford, I heard, we've heard a lot today uh, about vulnerability. That word has been used a few times. And with vulnerability, um, it, of course, those at the lowest level are going to follow what they see the leaders doing. And so if you have leadership who is not vulnerable, how could an airman or someone at the lowest level encourage you as a leader to be more vulnerable so that they feel more open to be vulnerable uh, with you? I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Um, because I think it has to start with trust, the trust that the airmen can come to their leader and ask at that level. Um, there are probably reasons that the leader is not vulnerable, and it could be some of what we talked about, about being seen, about that story being used against them or being seen as weak, you know, or something along those levels. I know personally, I am much better at asking questions than I am at answering questions. Uh, and probably if you ask my staff, they would say, he knows this much about us, we know this much about him, because I, I, I keep it close to my chest. Um, and so if I would tell the airmen, just keep asking um, and, and give that freedom, uh, because none of us, you know, I, d I don't want to be seen as uh, ineffective. Uh, and so it's that balance of being vulnerable and effective at the same time. Uh, now, I will, can I share a quick story? Yes, sir. I did see this with, a, with our DCOM at the time during the RAR process. Um, and at Reserve Command, we did uh, close to 2,800 of them. Uh, most of them came across my desk. During COVID, there were three of us growing up I have an old, had an older sister and a younger brother. I lost both of them during COVID um, and did not have the time to appropriately grieve because as the pastor, you know, would you please do the service as well, which sucks. Nope, don't, don't ever ask that to anybody. Um, I saw my senior leader come into my office because he saw me at a meeting almost come undone. And I was able to, to grab it back real fast. And I just happened to look up, and my two-star was standing there. And he said, Jamie, let's talk. And so that was a little bit of freedom there to, to be vulnerable. And he shared some of his struggles at that level, too. So. Thank you, sir. Chaplain Wilson? I am an open book. Um, I have nothing to hide. I, I firmly believe that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And so I just ask me whatever you want to know. The team that, that I get to serve with probably knows more than they want to know. Um, sometimes we have this prayer circle uh, slide that we look at once a month and that 
that staff meeting, and there was a time when the prayer request for me was, I just want to go to the bathroom. And so, they, but they appreciated it because they began asking me every now and again, so how's it going? You been able to? Yes, thank you for, yes, the meds are working. Um, I mean, really, so, so here's the other thing for me, why I think I'm an open book. I believe it's important to be viewed as human. And I always wanna be viewed as human and not on some pedestal, not perfect, etc. because I'm not. So that's part of how I attempt to humanize myself by sharing and answering any questions that come. Okay. So quickly, last, last question for, for the two of, of our uh, seniors here. How can the RST partner better help the chaplain, in your opinion, uh, storytell or tell their stories so that they can better serve them and partner with them in ministry? Yes. Uh, don't be afraid to be vulnerable first. Don't be afraid to, to lead in those things. Don't always look to the chaplain to lead in all facets. You're a leader in your own right, and you have your own gifts and talents and strengths that, that come along with all of that. And um, it, I think there's never been a time where I've seen us more empowered to, to be who we are. Uh, so lead in that. Sometimes, you know, um, even in leaders and dealing with leaders, it, it's not always the top leader that needs to lead in that. We need to stop looking and demanding top leaders to always be the most vulnerable. And let's do this at our level. Thank you. Um, I would say a slight, di slightly different spin in the sense that uh, a lot of times when you look around the base, you see a lot of uh, oak leaf clusters, carnivore birds, stars. So there's enough of those and occasionally people just wanna see the chaplain. And so when they're able to see the chaplain from the human element, um, I think as an RST partner, it's my responsibility sometimes to bring the chaplain into the fold of, hey, here's what's going on in this unit. And they want to know that you're able to help them in that space. So then they can feel safe enough to constantly want to come back, especially when you go to some of those organizations that are officer heavy and they're used to you know, acting a certain way. They're not gonna give you much to go with to help them. So adjusting our lens so that we can see the picture for what it is versus what they're portraying it to be. Thank you. Well, can we uh, give it up for our panelists today? Thank you for your responses and for your uh, vulnerability and your honesty and, and being able to tell your story. Um, I just encourage all of us as the chaplain, chaplain corps to tell your story. Don't be afraid to tell your story. Someone needs to hear it. Someone needs it. Uh, it can help us take care of one another better. With that, this session has ended. <laughs>